Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for July 31st, 2018, the last day of July. Yippee, it's here. Now we head into August, and the first few weeks of August we anticipate, not in a positive way for most people, um, the arrival of the peak of the hurricane season. It usually starts to ramp up significantly after about the 15th to the 20th of August, so still a few weeks to go of watching the pot boil, so to speak. All right, so today, uh, as we watch the pot try to boil, nothing over the next 48 hours. The same is true over the next five days, of course. And in the Atlantic, or I'm sorry, the East Pacific, a little different. This one area, well to the west of Mexico and the Baja, well on its way to becoming a tropical depression and eventually a tropical storm but it will stay far out into the open Pacific. And then this area is still at only 30% over the next five days. And as such, the sort of feeble attempt at the East Pacific to rule the basins this year continues to fall short for the time being. Uh, so let's move on, look at the satellite shot of the Atlantic Basin here from our awesome uh, friends I've never met them, but, uh, the, well, it's a guy. It's one guy behind tropicaltidbits.com, and that's pretty amazing if you think about it, what Levi Cowan has done. But we say friends, you know, in this, uh, it's just an expression. Uh, but it is fantastic to be able to have access to this kind of satellite data. So I just wanted to make sure I recognize where it's coming from. I wish I knew how to code like that. Let me get the red crayon. That's a little better. So another large area of dry... Uh, air and African dust being ejected into the Atlantic a little bit more to the north this time ever so slightly everything starting to shift northward you know just a little bit each day otherwise the intertropical convergence zone kind of squashed and dry you notice the skip that happens right there uh, there was an outage in the NOAA data stream I saw Levi tweet about that earlier today so that's why the satellite animation has a little skip in it. Um, and you see, of course, this stream of moisture continuing on the back side, of the western side of the Bermuda High. Uh, we do have a trough trying to carve down into the nation's midsection, so finally some rain and some flooding rain at times for portions of the upper Texas coast along parts of the I-10 corridor. A little bit of disturbed weather in the Gulf of Mexico and that will knock down some of those surface temperatures just a little bit. Uh, 30 degrees Celsius pretty much everywhere down there. That'll get chiseled away just a, a slightly. But we're going to look at some important things as we move along uh, that I want to show you regarding sea surface temperatures and whatnot. So moving on to the eastern Pacific, you know, still not much to really write home about. This continues to be really interesting to watch, this blow-up of thunderstorms at night. And then it moves generally to the west-southwest and dies off during the day, part of the monsoonal flow in northwest Mexico. Uh, but the monsoon out in the desert southwest is pretty capped right now. I was hoping it would flare up in the early part of August so that I can make a trip out there for a few days. It's just one of my passions. I think it's beautiful out there. But... Might have to wait and see if we get one of these hurricanes that rides up like this later in September before making any plans for the southwest, but that's a story for another day. So here's the one area. I don't even, I haven't even kept track of the invest numbers. Um, and then here's the other area. And there's some disturbances down here, but nothing that seems primed to really take off just yet. So you folks with plans in Cabo San Lucas, and Zewantaneo, Acapulco, Manzanillo, any of those places along the Mexican Pacific coast down here, you are looking fine for the next week to 10 days, probably. All right, so I want to show you this, some interesting developments as we look around and see, well, we don't have any hurricanes to track, nothing over the next probably 7 to 10 days, so what else can we look at, so to speak? And I wanted to show you the equatorial anomaly in the subsurface and uh, just kind of point something out. So this was updated on the 22nd of July. And you can see, so just to get you oriented, this is the surface right here. And then down here is 450 meters below the surface. And via an array of buoys 
and other temperature sensors that are placed across the equatorial Pacific. Um, the scientists that work behind the scenes, they, as we shall call them, are able to come up with this cross-section of the equatorial Pacific. And so in, in this particular shot, uh, everything on this side is colder than average. Everything on this side, on the right-hand side, is warmer than average. All right, so let me get a different crayon here, blue. So, you know, here, a vast part of the Pacific, you know, normal or average. And that extends deep down. You see that? And the same thing in the West Pacific, this sort of large chunk taking out, t taken out of the heat content. And the largest area of heat content that's above average is over in the eastern part of the Pacific at about 120 degrees west longitude. That's roughly where it is centered. So why does all of this matter? Well, this is not an El Nino. <laughs> I mean, it's just not. It's a little warmer than average right here in one area of the East Pacific, uh, but that's it. And so this is what it looked like on the 22nd. And now, the most recent update, that's always going to be a few days behind. I guess the data gets processed or something. Uh, this is from July 27th. And you see what has happened. You know, there was just a little connected area of positive anomalies in the far eastern Pacific. But those are gone now. And that has been replaced by, you know, oh, hey, look at that. Uh, interesting. Been replaced by colder anomalies. Yep. And, you know, this is really just not that big a deal. Uh, you know, even if you just draw it out to look at these different gradients here, zero to one degree Celsius above the long-term average covers just a small area of the Pacific. Everything else, I mean, this is so insignificant, and there's no large areas of uh, upper, I'm sorry, of, of higher end heat content waiting in the wings, so forth and so on. So. There's not going to be an El Nino in August and September to thwart the hurricane season in terms of the Pacific Ocean being warmer than it should be in a large swath. That's not going to be in play. And that's important because that was similar to 2004 where we had a late starting season and then we got bombarded uh, with several hurricanes in the Atlantic in a fairly short amount of time. Now, to be fair, the Atlantic was much warmer uh, than it is now in 2004. You know what? That's, that's not true. It wasn't much warmer. But when we're talking a degree Celsius or whatever, that doesn't sound like much. And I'm just correcting myself because I want to make sure I'm accurate. That's a lot of energy when you have a difference in water temperature of a half a degree or a degree Celsius. That's a whole different talk for another day. Um, it's called thermodynamics, and when you, you know, just a degree Celsius, if your bath water was 29 Celsius and you were able to increase it to 30 Celsius, would you notice? Probably not, but hurricanes do and storms do because the energy, when it's spread out like that over a huge area, is tremendous. And then you really start getting into thermodynamics and the mathematical and physical side of meteorology okay and I'm a geographer and that's beyond my pay grade admittedly but when you see it in the Pacific this is not a large area that's slightly above normal not at all and so it's not going to have that much of an impact all right so I just wanted to update you on that I thought that was a very interesting change uh, that we're eroding away you know and it's not being reinforced so no El Nino for August and September um, not even I'll say not even close. You know, the atmosphere may be trying to get that way, but it's not there yet. So what else can we look at? Well, this is very important. I mentioned this in a recent update. We can talk about anomalies, anomalies, anomalies. Departures from normal. The Atlantic's colder than normal. It's the coldest that it's ever been in the satellite era, uh, you know, out in the deep tropics. That's where they're talking about. They, me, uh, other people, whomever. All right, so... Um, that's all well and good, but what about the actual temperatures and the actual what we call heat content? And it's this heat content here, right over here on the right-hand side, tropical cyclone heat potential. That's what really matters at the end of the day. And 
the scale, and again, this too starts to get into more physics and mathematics that I would like to explain. So let's keep it simple. The higher up the scale you travel, the more upper ocean heat content or energy there is. And you can see that out in the deep tropics, it's fairly limited to south of 10 degrees latitude, which is right there. But once you get west of that area, uh, about 50 degrees longitude here, then the ocean heat content starts to go up. So yes, it's confined to the western part of the Atlantic Basin. And we will have tropical waves that come off and they'll start to develop out here somewhere. And then they'll get into this upper ocean heat content that is robust. And what are they gonna do if upper level conditions are favorable? They're gonna strengthen. I mean, look at Jamaica over here, surrounded by almost at the top of the scale, upper ocean heat content. Most of the Western Caribbean is at the top of the scale. A good deal of water off the southeast coast is in the middle of the scale. And that's important because that means that there is a lot of robust, deep, warm water, and that's the key that it's deep, throughout the Western Atlantic Basin, especially west of 60, south of 30 degrees latitude. And you could even argue, you know, south of 35 and 36 latitude, you know, roughly Norfolk and point south. And that's really going to be important later in the season. Not the anomalies anymore. Uh, not really. You know, what's done is done, okay? And, you know, the season's not over yet. There, there hasn't been an inactive season yet this year. Does that make sense? So to just write it off and say, well, nothing much is going to happen. Well, we don't know that. And, you know, you got to hope and pray, even though that's not a, by itself good planning tools, that, uh, you know, we don't get late bloomers coming in here and riding right up that heat content. That could be a big problem. Or they, you know, come through the Caribbean and up like that, you know, or come across the Florida Straits like that. Everything could develop right in here and all hit the United States. I'm just pointing that out. Hopefully that's obvious. But there's so much emphasis and so many people in professional meteorology tweeting about how great the news is of the cooler than normal sea surface temperatures out here that it's going to start to get some people who really don't pay attention to this stuff much anyway totally shutting it off. And it really will. Some people just aren't into this unless there's a hurricane coming. And then they might pay attention. And that's true. So they start reading from somebody about, oh, it's great news that you know the water temperatures are cooler than normal. Uh, and they go, all right, well, I won't pay attention to that very much. So let me just show you something else here. I got my things screwed up. All right, so we've talked about departures from normal. Wonderful. Well, this is the Reynolds um, Daily uh, Sea Surface Temperature Profile from the National Hurricane Center. And this is updated. It's always a day behind. It was updated on the 30th. And I showed it yesterday, but I want to point something out. This is the wide shot of the whole Atlantic Basin, the North Atlantic Basin anyway. And, uh, I mean, clearly you can see here, too, that the bulk of the warmer water, 27, 28 to 30 Celsius, is in the western part of the basin. But what I wanted to do, since there's been so much talk of the cold main development region, which is roughly this area through here, is and, and especially right out here the tropical Atlantic I thought well let me just dig deep and zoom into that all right so it's colder than average but it's still this is uh, Cape Verde right here Dakar and uh, the Cape Verde Islands the Cabo Verde Islands are buried in here somewhere I can't pick them out amongst all these um, let's see if they show up better on the other one where are they they just don't show up well that's fine so that's Cape Verde, and this is the 24 degrees Celsius isotherm right there. So that's 24 Celsius, not quite warm enough. And this, I'm going to draw in red, is the 26 Celsius right there. And I made sure that this was correct you know, on the wide map. I did my homework, so I'm outlining it for you. This is 10 degrees latitude right here. So, you know, it's, it's not like it's cold out there. And that's the other thing I see, people saying the Atlantic is cold, so hurricanes will be at a minimum this year. Well, that's BS. The Atlantic, uh, the, the tropical Atlantic's not cold. Um, 24 Celsius, if, if you had 24 Celsius water 
you would go swimming in that, and it would feel refreshing. You know, it's not cold, and 26 Celsius, which is all this, also not cold. And so that's the 26 C line right there. And look, there's even 27. Oh, you know, that's 81. That's nice. So, you know, the talk of anomalies, we need to probably start putting that aside unless we have something coming along and we want to see if it has extra heat content to work with. So I'm going to focus more on this and this, the actual temperatures and heat energy as we go forward and less on how cold or warm it is out here. Uh, and even though this is no 2005, I want to point out one more very obvious thing. In the historic, once in a 50 year event probably, hopefully, um, the 2005 season featured, of course, Katrina and Rita and Wilma and uh, Ophelia that impacted the Outer Banks. Um, what else? We had Dennis that came up in here. And uh, so that was, and Katrina, of course, was two landfalls here and then up here. Uh, Rita over this way, like that. And then Wilma came up kind of like that. None of these, none of them, were a hurricane in the main development region, a big fat zero. And most of the hurricanes that developed in 2005 were not hurricanes in this box right here. They were hurricanes well off to the north and west, just for what it's worth. So my point is the opposite end of the spectrum, when you have a huge season like 2005, very few of those major hurricanes formed in the main development region either. So while it's important, it's not the, um, it's not everything. And you know, for last year, it certainly mattered because it was much warmer out here, and Irma and Maria all got started. But you know what? They didn't get started. Well, Irma was pretty far north, but Maria kind of started late, kind of over here. And just for what it's worth, you know, even today, uh, if the same tropical wave came off at the same, if everything was the same except the sea surface temperature pattern, I bet Maria would still be able to become a Cat 5. You know, that would be interesting to talk about at a later time. If we had everything exactly the same, except the sea surface temperature pattern of this year was the only difference, would you still get a Cat 5 Maria? Probably so. So just don't worry about all this. Oh, it's cold and it's great news. It may be great news, but it's not yet. It's like saying, I played the Powerball. I might win the lottery. <laughs> You're right. You might, but you don't go around saying to people, hey, it's great news. I bought a lottery ticket today. Yeah, well, you still have a 1 in 148 million chance, or probably worse than that. Um, probably a lot better odds, honestly, that the Atlantic's running a little colder than normal of not being hit by a big hurricane than 1 in 148 million. But I just want to caution people. you got the doom and gloom side that always say that the end is near, and then you've got the side that just wants to bury their head in the sand. And I want to make sure we go right down the middle and just look out the window and see what's really going on. That's it. Really simple. All right. So with that sage advice, have a great rest of your Tuesday afternoon. I am Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, and I'll have some more for you tomorrow. <laughs>